All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. And we, I also have Ray Vrard, uh, the, the, co the project manager for, uh, for openchannels.org here with me as a co-moderator. Uh, we're very happy you could be here today. Uh, today we have on Mike Beck, uh, who's a lead marine scientist for TNC and an adjunct professor in ocean sciences at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He's going to be speaking today about the ecology, economics, and engineering of natural coastal defenses. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, Mike is going to be presenting, and we're going to have some time at the end for questions. And I know there's going to be a, a lot of fascinating questions. So um, you can go ahead and send them in at any point during the presentation. Uh, if there's any quick clarifying questions, we might address them while Mike is presenting. Um, but otherwise, we'll hold them till the, the Q&A at the end. Now, there's two ways you can ask questions. You can send it in to the, the questions uh, panel, and that will be private. It will only be seen by the panelists. Um, then there's potential for putting things in the chat. Um, if you have anything absolutely related to the webinar, and um, you may put it in the chat, and it can be visible to everyone, or you could send it just to the panelists. So, uh, but do feel free to send in uh, questions at any point. And, uh, all right, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. All right, excellent, uh, Sarah. Appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, appreciate uh, EBM Tools, Octo, and, and NatureServe uh, for for setting up uh, the, the the presentation today. Just as you mentioned, if uh, if there are kind of uh, clarifying questions al al along the way, then uh, you can uh, feel free to to stop me and and ask those. I won't be. Uh, following the chat per se until after the presentation, so I assume if uh, if something comes up that uh, that you'll kind of uh, uh, alert to me. Yep. All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, maybe maybe even uh, good evening. Uh, hope everybody is uh, doing well. Uh, as Sarah's mentioned, uh, going to cover uh, some of uh, the latest work that we've been doing uh, with a whole variety of partners uh, to, to to better understand uh, the ecology, economics, and engineering of natural coastal defenses. I think as everybody here uh, online knows, uh, our coastal risks are rising. Uh, there's uh, loss of habitats are increasing that risk. There's lots of interest from decision makers and others in finding cost effective solutions for addressing those risks. And a, a sort of wider recognition that nature based solutions could be a part of those solutions. But if we're going to be able to capitalize on that interest, then we've really got to be able to rigorously quantify the benefits from these habitats to know when, where, and how uh, they're able to reduce risk. And the good news is, and what I hope to uh, convince you of uh, during the, the course of this presentation, is that uh, we actually do know quite a great deal uh, uh, about how to uh, rigorously quantify uh, those benefits. Uh, before going further, I want to say that uh, all of this work is possible only because of some uh, great uh, collaborators, uh, including uh, from right to left, uh, Palayo, uh, Borja Reguero, uh, Sid Narayan uh, from, from our team here. Bohar and Sid are uh, with my team here. And then uh, Professor Inigo Lasada uh, from IH Cantabria, uh, the University of Cantabria, uh, who uh, I really learned everything from in terms of uh, coastal engineering. All right, this graphic here uh, explains a lot of, of, about why uh, we're doing this work. Uh, so uh, we recently compiled uh, the evidence on what kind of funding, coastal funding, went into what we might call natural or green infrastructure, conservation funding. Uh, so those are the bars over here uh, on the left, uh, both in terms of international aid and U.S. agencies uh, funding things like like uh, coastal habitat restoration uh, for resilience, it amounts to a few billions of dollars over, over a 10 year period. And then we looked at just some of the kinds of spending that goes into gray infrastructure, whether that's infrastructure aid, uh, uh, relief and reconstruction, or in particular, the funds after storms, uh, either the insured, that's the private funds, or the rest of this total bar, which is public funds, almost all of which goes into gray infrastructure, uh, gray defenses and the like uh, on our coastlines. 
in the conservation community, we talk all the time about wouldn't it be amazing if we could double the conservation budget, these small bars over here. Um, uh, and indeed, it would be amazing if we could double those budgets. But if we could change just, say, 10% of how we spend the rest of these funds on our coastlines, investing in green infrastructure for building uh, uh, the uh, coastal resilience instead of just gray infrastructure, then we would really be doing incredible things uh, for our coastal habitats. And that's really the basis for a lot of uh, what you're going to see in the rest of, of this talk. Okay. Starting uh, in 2016 and working really closely uh, with the World Bank, uh, we reviewed the evidence for what did we know about the role of mangroves and reefs in coastal protection. We had separate chapters uh, in this uh, large volume on everything that we knew uh, about mangroves and coastal protection, reefs and coastal protection, uh, how they were applied in, in policy and protection. Uh, and uh, I am going to uh, summarize that whole 170 page report in one slide. Um, uh, and it's important because it's the kind of basis for how we do uh, all of the estimations that you're going to see uh, in the rest of this talk. So to really be able to know something uh, about uh, coastal protection benefits and be able to uh, value them rigorously, we need to know something about uh, the wave environment offshore. Um, uh, as those uh, waves and surge come near shore, uh, we need to be able to model the changes. Uh, then we need to be able to take those uh, waves and surge over habitats estimate flooding, do that uh, across the entire storm frequency distribution, your one in 10 year storm, your one in 25 year storm, uh, to then be able to uh, assess the damages um, uh, with and without habitat. Uh, and here, what I've shown is an example of a flood line for a one in 10 year storm uh, with habitats. We then ask, well, what happens if you lost some or all of those habitats? Um, we rerun the models. We get a new flooding line here, the dash line uh, over in the bottom corner. Um, uh, and then uh, we look and estimate the people and the property between those two lines, because these are the people and the property receiving benefits from keeping those habitats in place. So again, you're uh, assessing the averted damages by keeping those habitats in place, and those averted damages are your benefits. Um, if you're in the engineering and insurance community, you're going, well, er, der, this is how we do it. Um, uh, but what we were trying to do is to really take uh, the, the ecological community uh, and apply these kind of same uh, rigorous models uh, to the, the problems uh, in ecosystem services. Okay, that looked really simple. Um, it's not. Um, this uh, describes uh, some of the data sets in each of the categories, some of the models involved, uh, and then uh, being able to, to, to ultimately estimate uh, the, the consequences across uh, land, people, property, uh, and the like. Uh, and uh, this is really uh, the uh, incredibly hard work uh, done by our collaborators uh, at IH Cantabria. Okay, so uh, what I'm first going to talk about uh, is some, some work that we released uh, just a couple uh, of weeks ago, our global report uh, on the value of, of mangroves uh, for risk reduction. Uh, and again, this is just a kind of a cute graphic of uh, what you can expect uh, as you lose uh, those habitats. Let's see, there we go. Okay. As part of all of this work, what we do, uh, again, as I had described in the earlier graphics, is to understand what is the flooding with and without mangroves. And so in this case, you got uh, two images of, of those model runs. This is for just one bay, uh, Bilao, uh in the Philippines. We're looking at a one uh, in 50 year flood with mangroves, those are in the green, and then we look uh, at the flooding in 90 by 90 meter units all around the coast here. And we're looking not just at the extent of that, that flooding, we're looking at the depth uh, as well, because that tells you a lot about the damages. We then remove the habitat and ask, 
how much worse is the flooding? Where uh, is that flooding greater? Where is it deeper? Um, uh, and we do this same level of modeling for all 700,000 kilometers of coastline with mangroves uh, around the world. More than 115 different countries um, uh, and all the places across those countries doing this scale of modeling uh, to be able to estimate uh, the, the, the benefits from mangroves for risk reduction. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of numbers. Uh, you know, we're going to we're going to look kind of in depth at the values and, and benefits. And uh, we showed, for example, some of these numbers uh, to the uh, uh, vice minister of the environment uh, in the Philippines. Um, uh, and after all of that, we showed this video. Uh, and the video is uh, from Deltares, just a nice little flume model showing waves. Um, uh, you know, uh, we had all these great numbers and uh, he kept asking, show me that video again, show me that video. I said, we got, we have all the numbers. Um, uh, show me the video again. I can show that uh, uh, to my minister, uh, you know. So uh, uh, all of this is to say, uh, it's really important to understand uh, and be able to visualize uh, some of these uh, benefits uh, that the, the habitats are providing. All right, now let's get into the numbers. All right. So what we do, uh, again, we did that same level of modeling everywhere around the world uh, with and without mangroves to understand people and property flooded across the entire storm frequency distribution. That's a return period uh, down here. Uh, and so again, we're looking at the people flooded with mangroves and then how many more people uh, would be flooded without mangroves. And then because we're doing it uh, across this entire storm frequency, we can integrate the area between these curves to get the annual expected benefits that is the annual averted flooding of people. And here I'm summarizing, uh, again, the annual averted damages uh, to both people and property with and without mangroves. Um, and you can see for people, um, there would be nearly a 40% increase in the number of people flooded annually uh, if we were to, to, to lose mangroves globally uh, and a 16% uh, increase uh, in damages to property. Uh, so mangroves are really providing significant benefits uh, uh, around the world uh, in both averted damages uh, to people people and property. And again, I want to uh, remind folks that this is done uh, in a very extraordinarily spatially uh, explicit manner. And so here we're summarizing into 100 kilometer units of the coastline, the annual flood reduction benefits. So we've ranked which countries are receiving the greatest annual benefits and the bars indicate uh, those values for those places, higher bars are uh, receiving greater annual expected benefits uh, from mangroves uh, in terms of flood reduction. I'll point out, for example, uh, that the U.S., uh, Florida uh, in particular, uh, receives many significant benefits from mangroves uh, in terms of uh, avoided damages. If we look uh, at the top 10 ranks, uh, you know, we can look uh, at uh, the people protected by mangroves, uh, and this is millions of people uh, uh, annually, uh, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, China, uh, ranking uh, near the top of those lists. In terms of property protected, uh, it's important to note that the U.S. actually ranks second uh, in this list uh, in terms of uh, property protection benefits uh, from mangroves grows uh, at 13 billion annually. But it's not just the absolute values, so the absolute benefits uh, of, of mangroves that matter, because uh, of course we're going to highlight some of uh, the biggest countries with the most property values, uh, biggest extensive coastlines and mangroves on them, but it's also uh, property or people protected per capita or per GDP. Here we're just showing uh, property protected per GDP. The results are similar uh, for uh, people protected uh, per capita, and it highlights 
creates a number of other nations. These are typically smaller nations, some of them small island developing states, um, uh, more vulnerable countries, uh, where mangroves are really providing significant benefits. And these are places that really don't have uh, the kinds of budget resources to otherwise be responding to the kinds of storm disasters uh, that they see. As part of this work, uh, we also uh, uh, partnered uh, with the Bundesentwicklungshilfe, uh, that is uh, the Alliance Development Works. It's a German-based alliance uh, of aid groups, uh, and you see some of those uh, aid groups here. Uh, the the uh, alliance uh, has developed the World Risk Report and the World Risk Index, uh, which really focuses on social and economic vulnerability uh, in addition to exposure. So if you're really trying to estimate risk, you're not just looking at exposure reduction, uh, which is uh, you know, kind of the, the values that I've been showing you up, up to this point. You're also thinking about vulnerability and trying to put those together. So risk equals exposure times uh, vulnerability uh, in your typical uh, risk index. And so here uh, we put together uh, where mangroves are providing the greatest flood reduction benefits with um, uh, what are the countries that are the most vulnerable overall. And here you begin to see uh, a change in kind of uh, highlighted countries uh, from uh, this sort of map uh, where you really see uh, gr much greater uh, risks and benefits uh, provided by mangroves, for example, uh, in, in Western Africa. And uh, that's highlighted here uh, in this uh, top 10 list, again, which uh, does highlight uh, quite a number uh, of places, both in uh, West and East Africa, where overall uh, mangroves might be providing uh, the greatest uh, risk reduction benefits, both in exposure reduction uh, and uh, vulnerability reduction. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is just to highlight that uh, these reports, uh, both a full uh, 100 page or so uh, technical uh, report uh, led by uh, IH Cantabria uh, and a shorter uh, six or seven page uh, summary report uh, are all available uh, at these uh, websites here. All right, everything that I have just shown you for mangroves uh, around the world, we have done all of that exact same work for the coral reefs of the world uh, and developed uh, a map uh, of uh, where coral reefs provide the greatest benefits, ranked the country, showed those annual expected benefits, and uh, don't try to adjust your screen. Uh, this is in fact fuzzy. Um, uh, for another two or three weeks, uh, uh, we can't show uh, these results, uh, but all of this uh, will be out uh, in mid-June uh, in Nature Communications. Uh, and the, the, the short of it is uh, that uh, coral reefs provide uh, even more significant benefits in flood reduction uh, than even mangroves do. Also, as part of our uh, work on uh, coral reefs, uh, we've been collaborating uh, with US, USGS uh, with support uh, from the Department of Insular Affairs uh, to be able to do some really high resolution mapping uh, of the, the benefits uh, provided by US coral reefs. So where we have uh, much better data on bathymetry, assets, topography, uh, then we're able to go from model where we're doing virtual transects every one uh, or, or rather yeah every two kilometers globally uh, to being able to uh, assess uh, flooding with and without reefs uh, in transects uh, essentially 100 meters apart. This shows an example uh, from Key West where we're looking at uh, one in 100 year flooding uh, with reefs uh, in uh, tan here. Uh, and then uh, what would happen if we lost one meter uh, in bathymetry of those reefs, uh, where and how much worse uh, the flooding 
thing would be uh, in red. And you can see essentially uh, we're working at uh, nearly a block by block level uh, or smaller uh, for, for, for all of the, the reefs of the, the, the U.S. And that's a report we're preparing uh, for release probably uh, in, in about uh, mid uh, this is work uh, led by Borja Reguero uh, uh, on our team. Uh, and then as part of that, we've been using this uh, to help uh, NOAA and FEMA as they think about uh, where to uh, restore reefs. Uh, and this uh, uh, lower left uh, uh, graphic is uh, some of the reefs in Puerto Rico uh, that NOAA is identifying for restoration uh, following uh, uh, the storms uh, this past uh, summer. Uh, and then uh, we provided uh, to in, in part to help inform uh, some of these activities, uh, the places uh, where uh, you might be receiving the greatest uh, benefits uh, from reefs uh, along these coastlines. This is like really, uh, this is stuff that we pulled off the computer um, uh, in the past couple of weeks. So uh, it's all new. Uh, uh, it's still uh, under review, uh, so just take uh, this with a grain of salt, uh, but uh, we, we do have quite a bit of confidence uh, now in how this is all working and, uh, again, really trying to uh, inform real-time decisions uh, with the kinds of data uh, that we're able uh, to uh, produce and examine. Okay. So, uh, so far, uh, what I've uh, been able to show you is that, uh, you know, we really are able to uh, assess and model uh, the benefits using, uh, you know, really state-of-the-art uh, engineering models, uh, the values and benefits uh, provided uh, by both mangroves and reefs. Uh, but obviously, it's important in this kind of environment <clears throat> to also be able to ask, well, how does the insurance world view uh, the benefits provided by these habitats? Do they uh, uh, view them? And uh, I'm just going to briefly describe some, some work that was published uh, uh, late last year, uh, led by Sid uh, Narayan uh, and uh, a close colleague from uh, Wildlife Conservation Society uh, when she was doing this work, uh, Carter Ingram. Uh, she's now with uh, Ernst & Young and uh, Chris Shepard uh, from, from our golf team. Were uh, supported uh, by Lloyd's of London and that you can find uh, on the, the, the Lloyd's website in addition to, to the scientific reports paper. Um, what we did with the help of Guy Carpenter, so they're an insurance broker, uh, we asked RMS, uh, Risk Management Solutions, they're one of the top, uh, top two modeling firms globally uh, for assessing risk. We asked, um, uh, do you guys include habitats in your risk models, um, uh, and if you do, what are the benefits that you estimate that they provide for storm damage reduction? Uh, and the short answer was, the first answer that we got was, um, we don't know uh, if we include habitats in those models. And it turns out that they did uh, include habitats, uh, and they were willing uh, to uh, assess those benefits. And so what we primarily did was to assess uh, those benefits uh, during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and so this is the, the path of Hurricane Sandy, uh, wetlands and green here. And we asked, what were the damages with and without wetlands during Hurricane Sandy within those RMS models? Um, uh, and so this is the width. Uh, this is the, the, the without. Uh, and then so then we ran those models and let me uh, just show you whoops, what uh, that looks like here. So this is uh, kind of one of their model runs showing the flooding. This is the, the shoreline. Uh, these are the, the water surge waters coming in and then uh, this is how they're moving up to land. Uh, along the shoreline uh, of Delaware Bay. And so they have, uh, you know, uh, essentially uh, really high resolution models uh, that we were using uh, to then estimate what did this flooding uh, look like uh, with uh, and without uh, those uh, wetland habitats. All right, so back to the presentation here. 
And these are the results uh, in sum. Uh, and what we're looking at here uh, is areas that uh, receive the highest percent benefits from uh, keeping those wetlands in place. Uh, so uh, areas in deeper red uh, received greater uh, flood damage reduction than other areas. All up, uh, this totaled some uh, $625 million of, of benefits during uh, Hurricane Sandy alone. Uh, we then also looked uh, across not just Sandy, but all the storms uh, in their database for Ocean County, New Jersey, uh, and asked what was the overall benefit uh, received uh, by those marsh habitats. Uh, and that was annually uh, a 15% average reduction uh, uh, in damages. And that's the kind of level at which uh, you might uh, expect to see uh, insurance premium reductions. Uh, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip over this particular graphic. I'm going to uh, note that uh, the work uh, from this report uh, showed up uh, quite widely in the industry. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a lowly ecologist. Uh, I never thought any of the work uh, that I would do in my career would be showing up uh, in insurance journal or claims journal. Uh, but it did. Uh, and again, because it was supported uh, by Lloyd's, uh, it received uh, really wide and uh, done by RMS, uh, really received uh, widespread interest, interest uh, in the industry. And, you know, I can say uh, without a doubt, uh, it's one thing uh, if, a, if a scientist or a conservationist, uh, you know, says, yeah, we show we show that uh, wetlands matter in our models. Uh, and it's entirely different thing uh, with decision makers uh, when uh, Lloyd's and, and RMS uh, say it. Uh, I also want to uh, briefly note uh, that as part of this uh, Lloyd's work, we also developed a report on financing uh, natural infrastructure. Uh, it's again available uh, off, uh, off the web, uh, Lloyd's website and the TNC uh, website. I'm going to summarize the, the, the whole report uh, uh, in the interest of time in one sentence, uh, and that is that all of the funding options that are typically used to fund gray infrastructure uh, from uh, seawalls, dikes, and others um, uh, are available for funding natural infrastructure once you're able to rigorously quantify the benefits that they provide. That's the short, the short answer uh, from that report, but you can get a lot more uh, if you uh, look at that in depth. Okay, what I, what I now wanna uh, switch to is it's not just being able to measure the effectiveness of these habitats um, uh, in terms of risk reduction. You also have to be able to address their cost effectiveness and their relative cost effectiveness uh, against, say, artificial infrastructure. And so uh, as part of this work, uh, led by uh, Borja Regero uh, and done uh, with David Bresch, uh, it started when uh, he was the head of sustainability at Swiss Re, uh, it was the world's second largest uh, reinsurer. Uh, we uh, worked in adapting, adapting their economics of climate adaptation models uh, into a public cost effectiveness model uh, that includes nature, to identify uh, where these nature-based defenses uh, might be most cost-effective uh, across the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to go into uh, the, the full suite of modeling, um, uh, but just kind of uh, uh, know that uh, it follows uh, very similar approaches to, to those that I was describing earlier in assessing uh, hazards uh, and damages, uh, but then really gets into uh, a deeper analysis uh, of the costs and benefits uh, provided by those habitats. We did this uh, across uh, the entire uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, and uh, we assessed uh, what were the uh, damages uh, from storms uh, at present, and then what would they look like both uh, under economic growth, that is to say coastal development changes, climate changes, uh, both sea level rise uh, and increases in storminess uh, to be able to total up uh, the risks in 2030. It's important to note <clears throat> 
from this graphic that if we're looking under what we're calling a high economic growth scenario, which, uh, you know, a 3% is high, but it's not extraordinarily high, that the risks, at least over this time period uh, from now to 2030, the risks from growth are at least as great, if not greater, than those from climate change. Uh, we talk all the time in the, in, in the conservation community about uh, the, the coastal risks associated uh, with climate change, but we often give shorter shrift to the risks both to the habitats as well as to people and property from this growth. And these are decisions that we're making every day on a local level. It's not just, uh, you know, what sometimes seem like big, intractable, global problems. Um, there are things that we can work on every day in terms of risk. And these are the sorts of things that insurers think about a lot because a long-term time frame uh, for the insurance industry is five years. We can talk more about that later. All right. So uh, uh, once we've uh, been able to assess uh, what those, those risks are and where they are across the Gulf of Mexico, uh, then we can begin to examine a variety of different solutions uh, for uh, risk reduction. Uh, and this list just shows some of the really large-scale problems, uh, large-scale solutions, rather, uh, that we were looking at from uh, wetland conservation uh, and then comparing against grayer solutions uh, like sandbags. Uh, and flood walls. Uh, we looked at many different scenarios. Uh, this summarizes uh, just one uh, of the kinds of scenarios that we looked at. What you're looking at here, uh, the height of the bar represents the benefit to cost ratio uh, of those measures uh, for averted damages. And this is the averted damages or the benefit uh, across the bottom in billions of dollars. So height of the bar indicates uh, a benefit to cost ratio. Higher the bar, more cost effective the measure. Uh, the wider the bar, uh, the greater total averted damages. Uh, in this case, you see that actually sandbags uh, were the most cost effective uh, defense. And that's because they're really cheap. That's why we use them a lot. Um, uh, so they're cheap to uh, implement, uh, you know, they have uh, relatively uh, uh, small averted uh, total damages. But all of the next most cost effective solutions uh, were in one way or another nature based solutions representing over $50 billion uh, in averted damages uh, between now uh, and 2030. So, what we really were able to show is that you can quantitatively compare um, uh, green versus gray solutions in the same framework and show uh, that those nature-based solutions uh, can be a very cost-effective part of the suite of solutions. And again, I wanna, I wanna point out that throughout this entire talk, we are never saying that, oh, somehow you're going to rely solely on nature-based solutions. It is never that. Risk reduction is always multiple strategies um, uh, from early warning, uh, you know, uh, all the way down to uh, the different kinds of solutions and even uh, risk transfer uh, or insurance. Okay, so uh, so far uh, what I've been able uh, to show you is that we are able to, to estimate uh, the effectiveness of these natural solutions and uh, their cost effectiveness. Uh, but I wanna also show you just one small example of how we're then using that kind of knowledge to design solutions uh, on the ground. Uh, and uh, this is some reef restoration uh, that we're doing in uh, Grenada. Uh, it's an area uh, that has received significant impact uh, from storm surges and erosion, uh, and which they're otherwise using uh, you know, some, some very poor defenses. Uh, in, in brief, uh, I'm going to note that we uh, work to develop a three-dimensional model uh, of uh, the, the waves and wave energy uh, coming into Grenville Bay uh, in Grenada. Grenville is the second uh, largest city in Grenada, has seen really significant erosion uh, on this uh, northern shoreline in particular. Using these models and looking essentially uh, with forensics, uh, you know, uh, at changes in the environment, we're able to show that the loss of reef height 
in this northern lobe of the reef was explaining the uh, uh, erosion and flooding problems that, that they were seeing. And so then we use that to design uh, a reef restoration solution, uh, which we're currently uh, piloting uh, there. So we've been working with the local community, uh, developing that reef restoration solution, putting it in place. Uh, you know, uh, you can see it working in terms of wave reduction uh, right away. Now we're still working on the full build out uh, to, to show shoreline line impacts uh, and then of course uh, you know really trying to uh, grow corals on that uh, you know uh, and in a place uh, in very far southern Caribbean uh, which uh, has much warmer waters uh, as well as sedimentation and pollution problems uh, you know uh, really grappling with and uh, putting together a risk reduction and conservation solution uh, is, a, is a challenge uh, but uh, one we're, we're facing up to now. Okay. Uh, in uh, in the last few slides, uh, I'm gonna uh, you know then summarize a couple of other ways uh, in which uh, we've been taking this information uh, and then using it uh, uh, with partners. Some of you uh, may have seen uh, uh, that uh, we recently uh, announced some work uh, with uh, the government of Mexico uh, and the Hotel Association uh, around Cancun uh, to begin to implement uh, first of its kind. Uh, insurance policy uh, for reefs uh, there. Uh, the core concept uh, is that we develop a trust fund uh, that uh, the hotel association and others uh, pay into, helps uh, restore the reefs, uh, but more importantly, helps to buy an insurance policy uh, for the reefs so that if they're damaged uh, during storms, uh, and uh, this section of coastline is one that's seen a lot of storms, uh, if uh, those reefs are damaged. It helps support uh, reef and beach uh, restoration uh, from those funds. And this is work uh, done jointly uh, with Swiss Re. We're also uh, working with Munich Re, uh, which is the world's uh, largest reinsurer, uh, to uh, develop a new kind of uh, resilience insurance. Uh, it's kind of like a resilience uh, bond uh, that could allow for um, much greater investment up front uh, in reef restoration. So the idea is you have uh, an investment uh, in uh, reef building, resilience investment uh, at the beginning, and that's paid for by reductions in the cost of insurance over time. So you're receiving benefits from that uh, uh, reef restoration. Those risk reduction benefits here in blue are amortized uh, and they help to pay for uh, that initial investment. And then if there's a storm, there's still an opportunity as well uh, for an insurance payout. Uh, this is still uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the development uh, phase uh, but we're uh, looking and discussing uh, with a number uh, of potential clients uh, for this kind of, of work. All right, so from this work, uh, we think that there are lots of different kinds of uh, implications and opportunities. Uh, uh, opportunities to include nature and industry risk models, uh, opportunities to create private incentives uh, for uh, insurance premiums or resilience bonds, very important opportunities for public incentives. Uh, you know, uh, instead of like just after Hurricane Sandy, when only about 1% uh, of the $50 billion that the US government paid in recovery went into green infrastructure, we think uh, after this past storm season that we should be investing a lot more uh, in our natural or green infrastructure. Uh, and we've shown uh, what those benefits are. And that's uh, not just here in the US, uh, you know, uh, it's also in Mexico and many other places. Uh, and we also think that there's opportunities to, to, to prioritize uh, natural infrastructure uh, in, in policy, both in cost benefit analyses, uh, as well as say transportation funding and programs like, uh, like the Philippines Greening Program. 
All right. Uh, well, I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, uh, time uh, today, and I'll just sum up uh, really briefly and say that you know, hope to convince you, uh, you know, that we really can rigorously quantify uh, the benefits uh, from wetlands and reefs, and show that uh, that really can inform a whole variety of uh, innovative approaches for uh, really helping to, to uh, conserve, manage, and restore our natural defenses. Thanks. Okay, Mike, well, this is amazing work uh, and getting kudos uh, online uh, from the Q&A and the chat. So thank you so much. We so appreciate you presenting on this. Uh, we do have a number of questions, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, one question, have you thought, at, uh, thought about or looked at the impacts of kelp forests in coastal protection? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, we, we actually need to get uh, uh, both more into uh, both seagrasses uh, and kelps. So uh, the short answer is we've thought only just a little bit about uh, that so far. Uh, one of Sid's recent papers, uh, you know, also provides some of the data uh, that was available uh, from, from seagrass and kelp. Their, their impact is going to be lower uh, overall uh, than say uh, mangroves or reefs, uh, but still significant, particularly I think as we get more into uh, considerations of erosion reduction. Uh, this work, uh, you know, the work that we've done so far, we've done a little bit on erosion, uh, but has really focused on flooding. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this is an interesting question. You mentioned that there can be artificial reefs. Is there such a thing as artificial mangroves? No, not not artificial mangroves. I mean, you know, I, of of all the the the, the coastal habitats, uh, you know, uh, we we probably uh, arguably know the most uh, about mangrove uh, restoration. Uh, and as we summarized in that uh, World Bank guidelines document uh, that I first started with. There are a lot of actually significant programs in mangrove, natural mangrove uh, restoration, and quite a number of them done uh, for risk reduction. You know, so in, in Vietnam, a place that uh, Vietnam and Philippines have seen uh, really the most mangrove uh, restoration overall, uh, and in Vietnam in particular, a lot of those projects have been led by organizations like the Red Cross, uh, you know, uh, and their mission is about uh, risk reduction first. Uh, and uh, they see the many benefits, both in, in exposure reduction, uh, as well as creating uh, opportunities for lives and livelihoods uh, uh, in those Vietnamese communities, uh, which help strengthen uh, their resilience uh, in the face of storms. Uh, just one more thing, uh, if I might here on mangroves, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons uh, in the community about, uh, about mangrove restoration and whether we're talking reefs or mangroves, we're always trying to talk about um, uh, not building new uh, or different habitats, but uh, you know, with mangroves using the, the, the same species, putting the right species in the right places, uh, that's what you're really focusing on. Uh, and with reefs, uh, just like oyster reefs, uh, you know, uh, in coral reefs, uh, we're talking about trying to uh, build back height that we've actually lost, uh, height and rugosity on those reefs, using a mix uh, of both uh, uh, artificial where needed, uh, and then things like uh, uh, plantings from, from nurseries to really get the corals back. Okay, thank you. And there's a question to follow up on that. Um, and we've got it from a couple, a couple of people have asked a question sort of addressing the same issue. As these nature-based methods, habitats are also impacted by climate change. How do you balance management recommendations and, and quantify outcomes over time? Um, and just add that another question specific to coral reefs, is the ongoing impact of coral reefs from warming ocean temperatures figured into the models? How are uncertainties in the success of reef restoration or the long-term resilience of existing reefs accounted for? Okay, that was a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> well, let's talk about- All right. I yeah, uh, I, I guess it's just the question uh, I, I understand and appreciate. And, you know, I, I'll say a couple of things uh, here. Uh, well, one, I want to start with uh, the fact that, because um, uh, this question always comes up uh, with, with natural infrastructure. And the first thing that I want to say in a more general comment is that we should not 
be holding natural infrastructure to some sort of different standard or different set uh, of questions uh, than we do with gray infrastructure. Um, uh, and that is to say that in a, a, an era of increasing uh, seas um, uh, and storminess, uh, you know, uh, that we've also got to be asking some of those same questions about our, the abilities uh, and the design of our gray infrastructure uh, to withstand those. Now, uh, with regards to, uh, you know, specifically then, you know, what happens to species, um, uh, uh, the, the models do not include that consideration per se, one. Uh, two, uh, you know, uh, I would say that I'm a little more optimistic uh, than, than some people are uh, about uh, the fate of corals, particularly if we can use this kind of work to drive the level of investment uh, that we need to see in managing these habitats. There's a whole great ton of innovative work looking at how corals, uh, you know, may adapt uh, to some of these changes, um, uh, how we can manage them better because um, uh, if we can reduce other stressors, we can uh, increase the opportunity uh, that those reefs will grow. And I think it's important to, to, to remember that, that reefs in particular, as compared to any of the other coastal habitats that I work on, reefs are actually in better shape than those other habitats. Now, they're declining um, uh, significant concerns. Uh, but I think if you compare those, say, for example, to marshes in the US or Europe or something like that, which we're also actively working to, to manage, conserve, and restore, we actually still have a lot uh, to work with in coral reefs. Um, we got to get to it. OK. Great, Mike. I, lo I love the point you made about um, holding, uh, not holding green infrastructure to a different standard than gray infrastructure. So I think that's a, a, a really great point. Um, let's see. Uh, well, there are lots of questions. Um, let's see, really good ones. Um, do you think protecting pathways for mangroves and other wetlands to migrate upslope is also a risk reduction benefit that TNC insurance entities and others would be interested in? Yeah, so uh, uh, the short answer is uh, definitely yes. Uh, you know, I think we, we, we do need to be looking uh, at those migration pathways, uh, you know, uh, thinking about how to do that uh, using programs, uh, you know, like, for example, you see uh, in the UK uh, around uh, marshes uh, where you're really thinking about land use and the space uh, for them to expand. Okay, that's half the answer. Um, the other half of the answer that I, I sometimes think that we forget about uh, in consideration uh, of, of these habitats is that over time, these habitats many times don't necessarily migrate, even in the face of sea level rise. They're moving up and down um, uh, with uh, sediment supply. So I think that we need to pay equal attention to the supply of sediments, which is often going to be uh, important upstream connections, um, uh, and thinking and ensuring that where possible, we build that resilience in place. I think that that's the other half of this solution. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, let's see. Uh, another comment, question, uh, great work. Have you ha have any of your data products been aimed at the public, in particular homeowners? What do you consider to be the challenges in doing so? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, not homeowners specifically. Uh, now, uh, again, uh, you know, we do think uh, that uh, the greatest uh, pathway uh, to, you know, more like uh, communities uh, and individuals uh, is, uh, you know, kind of uh, through trying to find uh, how we might be able to offer uh, premium reductions. Uh, you know, so for example, if you were uh, working uh, to uh, conserve uh, your, your marsh instead of uh, say uh, building, a, building a bulkhead, uh, you know, uh, then uh, you know, that uh, could, could get you insurance premium reductions uh, and then hopefully provide incentives to homeowners, uh, but it's kind of done more from, I'll just call it a little bit more top down or you know from from the industry side of this um, uh, you know the uh, other opportunities that that we hope to, to, to see grow we've been doing a bit of work with uh, 
uh, is uh, uh, with FEMA and the community rating system, uh, which essentially provides uh, credits to communities uh, to reduce their overall uh, insurance costs based on actions that they take to, to reduce risks. Right now, a kind of a primary thing that we've been working on uh, is uh, open space conservation uh, and, and ensuring that uh, uh, communities are both uh, getting and growing uh, credits uh, for, for, for open space conservation. Uh, it would be uh, very good over time uh, to see even greater benefits uh, uh, credits uh, for things uh, like uh, wetland uh, restoration. Okay, thanks, Mike. Is there anything going on in that vein with regard to oyster reefs? I know I've seen some work from North Carolina with just certainly encouraging people to be uh, adding reefs or restoring reefs. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we've been uh, we've been very uh, active with many partners uh, in uh, oyster reef uh, restoration, uh, particularly uh, you know for uh, erosion reduction uh, in part. But then we're usually uh, coupling that uh, with with marsh restoration as well uh, to then uh, hopefully deliver uh, some uh, flood reduction benefits. Uh, you know, uh, and we're doing uh, you know for example in the in the Gulf of Mexico, I'm now doing miles uh, uh, of projects, uh, you know, uh, stuff that we started uh, only experimentally, well, less than 10 years ago, maybe even just seven or eight years ago. Uh, so uh, that has become uh, an important part uh, of our portfolio uh, of restoration approaches. Uh, again, coupling, coupling uh, uh, oyster restoration to reduce uh, some of the, the, the waves and erosion uh, and, and building up the marshes behind. And I, I also, uh, if I might point out that that's also incredibly important uh, for mangrove restoration. So, uh, you know, we've got so much mangrove restoration going on, sometimes in places, uh, you know, where even we have planted mangroves uh, and then lost them uh, to, to, to waves and erosion uh, because we weren't coupling that with uh, thinking about what's happened to that outer barrier, the reefs, the first line of defense. Uh, you know. So uh, we often uh, in, in the conservation community uh, and in the risk management community, uh, I believe need to do a better job of coupling mangrove and reef restoration uh, to deliver the benefits that we wanna see. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, the last question, uh, the, the last question I received, um, and we have tons more, so I'm sorry, but it, it, it brings up an interesting point. You mentioned there are funding options for living shoreline defenses if you prove the benefits. Are there avail tools available to model and prove such benefits at local scales? And I guess just replying very generally, like how do people take, build on this work and sort of take this model and run? Yeah, that, that, that's actually a, a really good question. So, uh, you know, we've been trying to uh, work on uh, some of those uh, models and tools. Uh, one, uh, you know, some of those things uh, uh, are available uh, on coastal resilience uh, and on mappingoceanwealth.org. Uh, in, in some senses, you know, the kinds of things uh, that we're doing, for example, in the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Insular Affairs, the DOI project uh, that I described on, on coral reefs, well, that's going to provide essentially really most of the figures that you would need um, uh, for uh, anywhere with reef coastlines, coral reef coastlines uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, those are two options. Uh, you know, uh, a third option, uh, again, is to uh, work uh, with folks uh, like RMS or, or AIR, uh, that's one of the other uh, risk modeling firms, uh, to, to, to be able to uh, assess those benefits. And then lastly, I would say, you know, the the kind of work that we're doing, uh, you know, really can be a mainline piece of work um, uh, for a variety of uh, engineering companies and contractors. Um, uh, we've worked with uh, CH2M, for example, just one example, and we've worked with many uh, engineering firms, so I don't want to just call out one. Um, uh, but, you know, 
they're they're completely able to uh, assess uh, the, the the benefits of natural alternatives uh, against gray alternatives. Um, uh, in in essence, uh, we hope through this kind of research uh, to, to 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 work ourselves out of this business. Um, uh, you know, as a conservation group, uh, you know, uh, we need to help uh, folks understand that uh, this kind of risk modeling and assessment can be a mainline piece of work uh, for engineers, insurers, uh, governments, uh, and we should be focusing on, you know, how we do uh, the kind of difficult reef restoration that delivers um, uh, benefits to people and to those habitats. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, one question we'll tackle. Um, how do you represent the mangroves in numerical models? Is it additional roughness, solid elements of some function and dynamics? Yeah, so, uh, uh, well, uh, marshes uh, are, uh, prin so, so both, I would say, uh, are principally uh, roughness, uh, you know, so that would be uh, the, the principal way that, that we do uh, the vegetated habitats. Um, uh, the, the reefs uh, is largely uh, wave breaking. Uh, I would uh, refer you uh, to the, the mangrove technical report uh, for uh, all of the details of, of how that modeling is done. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Mike. Um, and just, uh, just can you, um, I'll, I was just trying to look it up so I could post. Um, one of the websites you mentioned or in the, a few minutes ago was coastalresilience.org, and the other one is mapping ocean wealth. Is, is that correct? Yep. Okay. Uh, well, it's uh, uh, maps.oceanwealth.org. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you, Sarah, after we're done. Okay, okay, and I can send it out to everyone. Okay, um, a question that's come up in various forms um, is, have you looked at how habitat quality, so fragmentation of reefs or mangroves, for example, and there's another question about types of seagrass um, affect the effectiveness of coastal protection? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Okay, so uh, in part we have uh, with reefs, so the reef models, uh, you know, uh, include uh, the main uh, role of reefs uh, in flood reduction is uh, is wave breaking, and that's principally uh, related uh, to to due to the height uh, or the shallowness uh, of reefs. Um, uh, but then there's a second component uh, of the roughness uh, or rugosity, uh, you know, which uh, you know uh, there are some relationships uh, between uh, that uh, roughness and the amount of living coral. So uh, in effect. Uh, some of our coral models uh, do do in fact uh, include condition. Um, the vegetated models uh, at present uh, do not. Now there's a great deal uh, of flume work, and I know, uh, for example, uh, IH Cantabri and Deltaris, uh, you know, have have done some of that work, uh, uh, as has Cambridge, uh, uh, Cambridge University, and others, uh, uh, looking at uh, you know effects of density uh, of uh, things like mangroves and marshes. Uh, you know, so there is an ability to look at that uh, at very fine uh, detail, uh, but uh, that, uh, particularly for mangroves and marshes, uh, you, we would know how to do it, but the data doesn't exist, uh, you know, just, just even, for example, density. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's almost uh, depressing to say that, uh, you know, uh, we, we know more uh, about uh, the distribution and condition of tropical habitats, uh, reefs and mangroves, uh, than we do uh, say about marshes. Just even the distribution, uh, you know, uh, and then you would need uh, some sort of condition, at the very least density, density and height uh, data for those marshes, n almost non-existent. Wow. All right. Well, that's depressing. Um, okay. Thank you, Mike. But solvable. And okay. So uh, yes. <laughs> uh, don't, don't, don't mean to leave on a depressing note. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a very solvable problem, uh, you know, uh, should be solved. Okay. Um, and I wanted to let everyone know that if you look in the chat, uh, Ray has posted the coastalresilience.org and maps.oceanwealth.org uh, web website, so everybody can check get those. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, okay, so one that came in, Mike, great presentation. I'm curious as to how actual damages were determined. Was it based on depth damage curves, um, as in HAZUS, or was some other metric used? I'm just thinking that just because something is wet doesn't necessarily mean it's damaged. 
Yeah, so that's a uh, uh, hey, hey, Brett. Uh, uh, so indeed, uh, now, now that I've managed to get my uh, my question answer window up, uh, uh, yeah. So we do in fact use a, a depth damage curve. Uh, uh, we use uh, uh, principally uh, has this uh, and uh, really in depth for the the U.S. work and the and the coral reef work uh, that that we're doing now. Um, uh, we use uh, much more generalized uh, depth damage curves. Uh, for the global work, uh, but but it is all uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, roughly based on on Hazus and the, the the new JCL curves out as well. Okay, thanks, Mike. And hopefully everyone saw um, uh, Brett also posted um, uh, their good models of wave decay through coastal salt marsh vegetation. There's a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers report by Anderson et al. 2013. So that might help address someone's question earlier. Um, one last question, really big picture, um, but I think you have addressed some of the equity issues in some of your work. Um, okay, so here's a question. This may be more of a finance question than an ecology question, but how do we address the fact that the most vulnerable to coastal flooding lack the kind of insurable assets that could drive investment in the wetland, in wetland reef conservation? Yeah, so so it's true. In in, in this presentation, you've seen a a, a greater focus uh, on uh, uh, property and dollars. Uh, and I I do want to make it, so I appreciate that question a lot because I want to make it clear, uh, you know, uh, that uh, you know, uh, look for for starters, uh, as a, as a conservationist, I think we ought to be preserving uh, these habitats in many uh, places, simply for their intrinsic value. Um, uh, but I also recognize that um, uh, in order to convince many decision makers, uh, we got to put it into, into people and property terms. Uh, and then frankly, for a lot of them, dollars. Um, uh, those things said, uh, you know, we actually have done uh, a lot of work to, to understand, uh, you know, for example, our work with Alliance Development Works, uh, you know, uh, where uh, these habitats uh, might be uh, most important to uh, particularly vulnerable people, uh, where that data is available, we can actually directly incorporate it into our analyses. Uh, I didn't go over it here, but we have a, a, a World Bank uh, report uh, out last year specifically for the Philippines where we did the mangrove work, the, the work that I showed globally, we started uh, doing just in the Philippines uh, and, uh, and their data on uh, people below poverty was available. So we can show most where mangroves might matter for property protection and then uh, where it matters most for uh, reducing risks to the most vulnerable people. There's a lot more to say here, uh, including uh, people in these cost effectiveness curves. Uh, we'll be glad to cover that uh, some other time. Okay. Well, we hope to, we would love to have you on again, Mike, to, to dig into some of these issues more. Um, thank you so much for presenting. You, I know you have a crazy travel schedule, so we're so glad you took the time to do this. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, we really appreciate you, you taking the time and, and our best wishes for your work. So, all right. So hope everyone yeah. has a great rest. And indeed, my, my thanks to you, uh, Sarah and Ray, uh, and uh, for, for, for setting all of this up. And uh, my, my thanks as well uh, to, to the folks, the great questions uh, and attentiveness. Much appreciated. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a, have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.